Well, last week, we looked at this passage, Romans 4, verses 13 to 25, and I told you that it just, I can't. I, I, I was not able to just preach it in one message and still be able to highlight all of the rich truth that is found in these verses. So we split it up into two weeks, and we're looking at it really from two angles. From one side, last week, we looked at what did God say? What promises did God make? And so last week, we looked at this passage with an emphasis on examining God's promise. What did God say? What did he promise? And this week, we're turning and and looking at the other side of the coin. Because God makes promises, but Abraham believes God. So last week was about what did God say? And this week is about how did God, how, how did Abraham respond to what God said? When scripture tells us that Abraham believed the Lord and God counted it to Abraham as righteousness, we understand that there is something specific that Abraham believed. It wasn't just a general catch-all belief, pie in the sky, abstract kind of idea. It was he believed in something firm and something fixed and something that was clearly stated to him. God had promised Abraham certain things and Abraham believed in what God said and he believed that God could and would fulfill those promises to him. So last week, we looked more specifically at God's promises. And this week, we look at how Abraham responded to those promises. So please take your Bibles and join me in our passage this morning, which is, again, Romans 4, verses 13 to 25. And when you get there, would you please stand for the public reading of Scripture? Romans 4, verses 13 to 25. And uh, just follow along with me as I'll be reading from ESV. Romans 4, verses 13 to 25. It says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null, and the promise is is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. May God bless the reading of his holy word. You may be seated. Sometimes I get funny questions and, um, well, just not funny, but they're just interesting questions. They're questions I would not expect to receive. And uh, I think someone is asking me like, why, why do we stand for the public reading of scripture? I was like, this is a good question. And I think we stand out of respect for it. In fact, uh, in ancient Jewish times, uh, during the times of Jesus, uh, sorry, this is like a total side tangent, but perhaps you'll find it as interesting as I do. What would happen was that everybody 
would stand as the, uh, as the leader, as the teacher of the synagogue read scripture, usually scroll, right? And they had to stand for it with like two little troughs for the scroll, right? And left side. And they would, everybody would stand as the teacher of the synagogue read it. And then he would sit down and teach. And the reason he would sit down and everybody else would sit down was to communicate this idea that God's word stands above all, above everyone. Nowadays, I don't know why we stand up. It's probably because it aids the projection of your voice. But when we do stand for the public reading of scripture, it is a gesture of respect. Uh, and, And to be honest, there are days when I feel that because we've read scripture, I know you got something out of the sermon. And that might be the most important thing that you hear today is just the reading of scripture because God's word matters so much more than anything that I would say. Tangent done coming back. God's promise, looking at God's promise. And these are two concepts, right? We have faith and we have God's promise. We have what was promised and how Abraham responded. And these are two concepts that stand out very clearly to us in this passage. Here's verses 13 to 17. In yellow, I've highlighted all of the promises or what God promised to Abraham, either the word promise or what God promised. And then in purple, I've highlighted the idea of faith, of belief. So you see, there's a lot of yellow. There's a lot of purple. There's a lot of mention of promises, and there's a lot of mention of faith or belief. This is verses 13 to 17, and this is verses 18 to 25. And last week, we looked at the content of God's promise. And this week, we look at how Abraham responded. So join me as we look at exploring Abraham's faith. And as we explore his faith, there are five elements that stand out to us. First is that Abraham's faith involved belief in God as a person who keeps promises, as the one who keeps his promises. Really, verse 16 is where I wanted to focus, but we need a running start. So we'll start in verse 13. It says, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is through the, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why, verse 16, that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So the larger argument is if God's agreement with Abraham, if his promise to Abraham was based upon Abraham's performance, if it's a performance contract, it would be closer to some sort of contractual agreement some sort of work arrangement. God would have to follow a contract. But instead, verse 16 reminds us that faith depends on God as a person who keeps his promises. Abraham's faith was not only tied to a specific promise. His faith depended on the person who made the promise. We all understand, and I said this many times last week, that a promise is only as the good is only as good as the person who makes it. Now, we are uh, in a in an election season, and there are a lot of promises being made. There are a lot of offers being given, and one of the things is you have to ask yourself: Can this person deliver on what this person has promised? We understand that, and in the same way, when we look at what God promises. We have to ask, will God do what he said he would? Is he able to do it? Do, I, do we believe that he can? Not that belief makes it happen, but we act based upon whether we believe his promises will come true. Because promises are only as reliable as the promise keeper. 
Yet when it comes to believing in God, Abraham believed his, placed his trust in the one making the promise. Abraham uprooted his entire family and relocated to an unfamiliar territory. He obeyed God. And Abraham's actions are the direct result of his faith in God. He would not have done these things unless he actually believed God. Abraham believed in God as a person who keeps promises. Second, Abraham believed in the actual promise, in God's actual promise. Not just as somebody who keeps the promise, he believed what God said, the actual promise. Verse 17 says, as it is written, I've made you, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed. Now, as we learned last week, this verse is a quote from Genesis 17, 5, where God declared unto Abraham, no longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. It's a lengthening. It's an enlarging. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Abram is likely uh, related to this concept or this, uh, these, the fusion of the words, the father is exalted. But when God gave Abram his new name, Abraham, it meant father of nations or father of a multitude. And as I said last week, for Abraham to adopt his new name, for Abram to go from Abram to Abraham and to introduce himself to people as I'm not, oh yeah, you know, also known as Abram, but actually now it's Abraham would have been challenging Because every time Abraham used his name, Abraham would be reminded that, yes, I'm the father of a multitude, but I have no biological children through my wife, Sarah. I'm the father of many nations, but childless. It would have been awkward. Every introduction would have been an awkward uh, awkward scene. Oh, father of a multitude, you must have a huge family. I'm childless. Oh, okay. Just don't know how to respond to that, right? Sometimes you're stuck in an awkward conversation. I'm sure Abraham uh, did that to a lot of people without meaning to. To be without children during this time period would have been a social stigma for Abraham and Sarah. One of the things that people in this time period would pray for is we pray for many children, for a large family, to enlarge our tents, enlarge our household to have a blossoming and blooming and fruitful family, to make many descendants, to develop and enlarge the clan. That was was what people would have prayed for, whether it was to the one true God or whether it's to any God in that time period. A lot of the the, uh, religions back in this time period were centered around gods of fertility. And they asked for Fertility, for human fertility, but also for the land to bring forth its yield. So to be without children, Abraham and Sarah probably went around asking the experts for help in trying to conceive. They were wealthy, so they could they could pay to they could pay for it for sure. And yet the fertility experts were unsuccessful, although I'm sure that they made promises. So I'm sure on some level, if we were to use our sanctified imaginations, hearing, don't worry, you're going to have a child. I'm sure at some point, Abraham Abraham and Sarah were like, oh, you've heard that one before. (laughs) I've heard that before. Still childless. I've heard that promise before. I just don't know if I can believe it. And every time Abraham would contemplate his state, and how he longed, he and his wife longed for a child. You got to think through what Abraham would have thought of. Why do I still not have a child? Why am I still childless? I had a name change, but ain't nothing changed. (laughs) I, I said I'm supposed to be the father of a multitude. I can't even father a child. And this God 
who commanded me to uproot my whole family and move to an area I'd never been to, to an area that was foreign to my family and my forefathers, has told me I will be the father of nations, the father of a multitude. And yet, I am still childless. This is what Abraham would have faced. This is his dilemma. This is his mental struggle and the back and forth that would have happened in his mind as he thought about his plight. And it would force him to go back and say, did God say it? Did I hear right? Did he really say that? Did he really promise that? Do I believe him? Is he able to do it? Can I rely on the one who made this promise to me? Unlike all of these fertility experts who will promise children a plenty and I got none. Do I, do I believe this God? Can I rely on him? Did he truly say it? And is he able? So Abraham would have had to, in working out his faith, believe that God is someone who keeps his promises and to believe that God actually made a promise. And also he would have to believe that God was powerful enough to overcome anything. He had to believe in God's power to overcome anything. And verses 17 to 19 reminds us of who God is. Picking up in the middle of verse 17, it says, God is who? God is the one who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Now these verses remind us And we can draw from it three things that Abraham believed about God's power. That God was powerful enough to overcome death. To overcome death. Now, when we think about Abraham's faith, we have to think that, you know, we have, we have Genesis and we have like everything after, right? And then it's usually like bound into a nice leather, leather cover and everything, Smithsonian and all. And, you know, spines and hubs and beautiful gilt edges and whatever. So, but Abraham did not have these things. He did not have these things. He did not have the rich treasure of scripture that we have access to. He had to trust God based on God's word. And when I say God's word, what God told him, not what was written because nothing had been written yet at this point. Now we look at this and we go, wow, Abraham believed that God could overcome death. And we might think, well, that's in there. That's in the Bible. I, you know, flip back a little bit. First Kings, right? Elijah, did not Elijah bring back a boy from the dead? Right? Did not Elisha, the, the, the successor to Elijah, raise the Shunammite's son from the dead? We've got evidence of that. We have testimony and witness and records of that. New Testament, Lazarus come forth. We know that. We, we know that we've been taught that. We have access to those things. Jesus raises Jairus' daughter, Mark 5. We know that Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day. See, for us, when we look at that God had the power to overcome death, yeah, the cross is empty. We know these things, but Abraham did not have access to this because the history had not taken place yet. The record and the testimony of God's power, God's wonder-working power, God's ability to raise people from the dead was not written. We have access and we can book chapter verse that. Abraham did not. And it's a reminder to us that in every age, not just the age of Abraham, that the most final of human events is never too late for God. It is never too final for God. And while we may have records of God's power in scripture preserved for us to meditate upon and to inform what we believe, Abraham did not have such testimonies at this time. 
And even later, when God eventually commands Abraham to sacrifice his one and only Isaac, you know, the son of promise, the son that he waited a hundred years for. Hebrews eleven nineteen tells us that Abraham considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, which from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So when, when Abraham's sitting there going, God wanted me to sacrifice my one and only son, Isaac, the one that he promised to give me, who would become my descendant and, and, and the father of, an, of nations. Like, I don't understand how this is going to work. But Abraham believed that God, if he wanted to, could have raised him from the dead. And he did that without the benefit and the blessing of having accounts like Lazarus or Jairus' daughter or Elijah, and the, or the miracles of Elisha. This was Abraham's faith. And we are, we, 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 we stand in respect of it. That is significant. We also know that God's power, Abraham also believed that God's power could overcome hopelessness. Verse 18 says that Abraham dared to hope against hope that God would make him the father of nations. Abraham and Sarah both understood that she was way, and in my notes, it actually says a lot of A's, way too old, way too old. And I know, I know everybody around here gets all sensitive about getting older and getting grayer and like all the back pain. No, she's ancient. To have a kid? Oh yeah, she's old. You'd laugh about that. You would laugh about this. And that's why Abraham and Sarah, when God first disclosed that to them, they were like, Oh, Abraham's going to go have a child through their servant, Hagar. Because they naturally assumed that it would be, that, 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 that would be how it should be done. And when he says, well, you're going to have an heir, you're going to have descendants. Abraham also responds, oh yeah, my heir is Eleazar, my servant. He naturally assumes that. And that's because it would have been the no duh, everybody understands that you can't have a child situation. After decades of trying to conceive, how else would God dare to fulfill this promise? And yet Abraham had faith, which is the assurance of things hoped for, Hebrews 11, and the conviction of things not seen. And God's power, Abraham believed also, would overcome barrenness. Verse 19 tells us that Abraham dared to believe that God would overcome Sarah's barrenness. Now, Abraham, we understand, was later able to conceive with Hagar. So we may infer that their childlessness was attributable to Sarah's barrenness. Sarah Sarah was infertile. And yet nothing is too difficult for the Lord. And in Genesis 17, 17, Sarah gives birth to Isaac at 90 years old. 90. 90. 90. So when we say way too old to have a, for, uh, have a first child, I think we can say way too old applies to 90. And hopefully nobody here gets offended because that's just, uh, that's, it's insane to even think about. Even people who are 90 would call themselves old. And even people who are 90 would say, oh yeah, ancient, like impossible to have a first child. Remember that when God first called Abraham, Abraham and Sarah were already seniors. They were already senior citizens, okay? They got the senior discount. Abraham was 75 and Sarah was 65. To hear someone say, yeah, you're going to have a child 65 years old. You're, you're kidding, right? <laughs> That's pretty funny. I'm, I'm like grandparent age. What are you talking about? I'm gonna, a child or a grandchild? You, you left the grand art out. And so when God makes it clear that Abraham is going to have a child and not just any biological child, not just a, a stepchild, it's like he will have a real child with Sarah, that Abraham and Sarah, Abraham plus Sarah are going to produce a baby, a son. By the time God makes that clear and he says, no, 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 no. I know you thought it was just a child, any child. I, I mean, Abraham, Sarah, Abraham plus Sarah, child, baby. Abraham plus Sarah, baby. By the time God makes that clear, Abraham's 86. Which, doing the math, there's a 10-year gap. Sarah's 76. Sarah is 76 years old. 
This is no longer like an issue of, oh, she's just barren. Like, no, 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 nobody's, nobody's fertile at this age anyway. At 76, a woman is way, typically way beyond childbearing years. And they are looking forward to the blessings of grandparenthood, not parenthood. But again, Abraham placed his faith in God. And he believed in God's power to overcome death, hopelessness, and infertility. Abraham believed that God would do what he said he would do. And Abraham believed that God was powerful enough to overcome the significant obstacles that were in front of them. And the fourth element in verses 20 to 21 that we see in Abraham's faith is perseverance. It was a belief that perseveres. Verses 20 to 21 says, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Now, wait a second. When you read that, if you are familiar with Abraham's life story, that sounds a bit optimistic. After all, Abraham did end up having a child, Ishmael, with Hagar. Genesis 12 to 24 tells us, those chapters tell us that Abraham was certainly not a perfect believer. But in the end, Abraham's faith did not fail. And that is the overarching point that is being made here. Struggling faith is not the same as non-existent faith. Just as the temptation to sin is not the same as sin. And so instead of growing weaker, as his body did, Abraham's faith grew stronger as he gave glory to God. Abraham did not have all the answers about how God was going to fulfill his promises. And we know that because he went and like, well, let's try alternatives. Uh, Okay, Hagar, Ishmael. I'm going to have an heir. Okay, Eleazar, my servant. Abraham didn't know exactly all the details. They were revealed progressively. God would add, oh, no, no, I meant this. Oh, okay. You know, uh, oh, I'm adding this. Okay, okay. And as God clarified with each, with each clarification from God, it was almost like a call to, do you believe me now? Do you believe me now? Do you believe me now? Godly faith is not necessarily about having a full understanding It is about having a full trust. And ultimately, Abraham's belief persevered. It did not fail. Fifth, Abraham's faith had a belief that establishes a pattern for future generations. And this is verses 22 to 25. So that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Verse 22 offers this summary explanation of the fruit of Abraham's faith. It was like a conclusion. That is why. Do you understand? That is why. It's a conclusion. After explaining in detail and describing what it took for Abraham to really believe God, it says that is why his faith is counted to him as righteousness. You know, when we read scripture, one of the common temptation is to wonder, is to look at it and go, what does it have to do with me? But God's word has been recorded and preserved for multiple generations. And God's word is for all believers in every age. And the story of Abraham establishes a pattern for us today. That we can look at that, we can examine that, and understand that we are saved saved in the same way that Abraham was. We are saved by faith. God is the one who counted Abraham's faith as righteousness. And this reckoning, right? This This counting, this I'm going to consider that faith as righteousness is something that only God can do. It's not something that we can do. We can't like change the identification of our faith to righteousness. We can't rename it and redefine it. And that is why this passage ultimately teaches us doctrinal truth 
that salvation comes by grace through faith. Verses 23 to 25, it says, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So I ask a what, why, and a how. What? What is this? It is justification. What is it that God did for Abraham? What does God do for people who have faith like Abraham? The answer is that God saves them by declaring them to be righteous, by justifying them. And this declaration of righteousness is formally called justification. We've already learned from Romans 1 to 3, and we were reminded of that a little bit earlier as we read scripture, that nobody can make himself righteous before God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet the very next verse after that pervasive indictment is that we are justified by his grace as a gift. We have no righteous standing before God. And if anything, our works disqualify us before God because nobody is perfectly righteous. God does not grade on a curve. And in, but in salvation, God makes us righteous. God declares us to be righteous before him. And that is justification. And why does God do this? He does this because of his grace. What is it that compels God? What is it that drives and motivates God to justify the ungodly, as it says? What, what is it that prompts him to do this? We need to understand that God is not obligated to save people. He is not required to save anyone. And God does not owe anything to anyone. Therefore, when God declares us to be righteous, when he justifies the unbeliever, it is because of his grace. Why would God justify us? It is because of his grace. The only way we could be declared righteous is if God freely provides salvation for us by grace, totally apart from our work, or perhaps better, in spite of our deeds. So what does God do in salvation? He justifies us. He declares us to be righteous. As a judge slamming the, the gavel down, he says, righteous. And why does God do this? What is it that prompts him to do it? Is it because he said, well, I better do it. Otherwise, somebody else is out to get me. No, God does it because of his grace. Because it is in line with who he is. With the mercy that he wants to bestow. With the grace that he wants to show. Now, how does God do this? How does God declare us to be righteous? And it is through faith. Abraham believed God and it was counted or credited or reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, faith is the instrument through which justification takes place. Galatians 2.16 says that we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ. So let me illustrate this a little bit. Let's say you're out on the boat. You're out on a boat with a friend and you accidentally fall off the boat into the river. And you know that you're in danger, that this is not a good thing because you can't swim. And yeah, you forgot to wear your life vest, a no-no for boating. And as you flap your hands around the water, you know you're in a terrible way. And your friend throws you one of those lifesavers, you know, one of those floating donuts. And you grab hold of it for dear life as your friend slowly brings you back onto the boat. And when you get onto the boat and you finally catch your breath and throw up any water that you had swallowed, what do you do? 
You go and give the lifesaver a hug. You go up to that floating donut and go, oh, thank you so much. No, you say thank you to your friend. It's your friend who saved you. And yes, he used a flotation device to do it, but it's your friend who ultimately saved you. The lifesaver was the instrument by which he saved you. It is the instrument by which you were pulled from the water, that you were prevented from drowning. And in the same way, faith is the instrument through which God justifies people. And when we think about it, this is the exact opposite of self-reliance. Genuine trust in God is only possible for someone who stops trusting in self. Authentic faith says, I cannot do it. God is my only hope. God is able. And he is willing. And when we can finally admit this, God sees it. God acknowledges it. He counts. He reckons. He credits it, our faith, as righteousness. And that is why we say we are saved by grace because of his grace, motivated by God's grace is what motivated him to save us. And we are saved by grace as opposed to our works. We are saved by grace through faith in God. And for us today who live on this side of the cross, who live on this side of history, we can more specifically declare that salvation comes to us by grace through faith in Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. God declares us righteous because he is gracious, not because he owes us. And because of what Jesus is, because of Jesus' perfect life, God takes the righteousness of Christ and imputes it. He credits it, kind of taking away from his account, crediting it to our account, to us, so that when God looks at us, he sees Christ's perfect life. This is what we mean when we say that on the cross, God treated Jesus as if he had committed our sins so that we might be treated as if we had lived his perfect life. Now, I want to direct us to two lessons for our edification this morning, because this passage has been quite technical as far as making an argument of salvation by grace through faith. But first, first reminder is that faith is not blind to real obstacles. Faith sees God more clearly. You know, sometimes you hear people speak of religion and they assume that faith just requires turning your eyes away from the reality. Just close your eyes and believe. Don't think, just trust, right? That's kind of the common assumption from the world out there. Critics of Christianity accuse believers of adopting a blind faith, that we ignore obstacles, that we ignore the reality, or that we pretend as if obstacles don't really exist. But this is not the testimony of Scripture. It is decidedly not what Romans 4 teaches us about Abraham. Quite the contrary, in fact. Abraham knew well what God was promising. And he didn't have all the bits and pieces and God would progressively reveal the details, okay? But Abraham knew the challenges of conceiving a child in his really super old, way too old to have a baby age. And especially for his wife. I mean, it was really laughable. Abram knew the challenges of conceiving a child in their age, at their age. Yet Abraham believed. Christianity is not about having a blind faith. It is not the willful suppression of what you see around you. It is not kind of willingly placing, making yourself blind and deaf and, and just kind of like, well, I don't know, just have faith, just have faith. It's not about closing your eyes to the real life challenges you see around you. 
Christianity does not call you to be blind. It calls you to see more. It calls you to see more. Abraham knew very well how old he and his wife were. Abraham saw their white hair, saw her white hair. He saw their wrinkled faces. He knew how weathered and worn they were. But Abraham chose to believe God's promises because he believed in who God was. Abraham saw the obstacles, but Abraham saw God more clearly. If you are a believer, you need to be reminded to open your eyes to the reality of who God is. We worship the God who created the world and everything in it. As our passage says, literally the God who calls into existence that which does not exist. He creates from nothing. He speaks and it comes to pass. We worship the God who gives hope to the hopeless, who gives life to the dead. And we worship the God who loves us so much that he would send and sacrifice his only son to rescue us. We don't need to have blind faith. We need to have eyes of faith. We don't need to ignore the difficulties that we see in this world. We need to remember that we worship the God who can overcome it all. We need to see that our Lord is more than able to accomplish what he wants in our lives and in the world. The one that I remember the most, the, the example of this in scripture is, is Joshua and the 12 spies. All 12 spies saw what they saw when they went and visited and toured and spied out the land of Canaan. And they all came back saying, indeed, this is a land flowing with milk and honey. This land is a good land. This land is a fruitful land. This land is a land worth fighting for. But 10 out of the 12 came back. Well, all 12 came back and 10 out of the 12 argued and said, but, but the people are too big. Their cities are too fortified. Their walls are too thick. Their defenses are too strong. You know, Joshua and the other spy who were in the minority, Joshua and Caleb, they said, yes, but God. It's not that they didn't see those things. It's not like they were blind to the fortification of the cities. They weren't blind to the, to the, to the fruitfulness of the land, the goodness of the earth that was there. They were not blind to the fact that, well, generally speaking, the Hebrew people at this time were uh, known as kind of being shorter, which is why they described them saying, and we were like ants in their eyes. We're like little short people. We're going to go up against this NBA team. This is crazy. Joshua and Caleb saw all of those things just like the other 10. But what made the difference was that Joshua and Caleb saw God more clearly. And they said, if God has given it to us, then it's ours. We just need to go and get it. It's not the circumstances that were different. It was their views of God. And that goes back to faith. Faith is not blind to real obstacles. It's not blind to the challenges of everyday life. But faith sees God more clearly. Unless we think that faith is just about nodding our heads in agreement with something and then walking away as if it doesn't matter. We also need to remember that genuine faith results in life change. Genuine faith results in life change. Abraham's faith was not a theoretical faith. It was not a faith that I believe it and it means nothing to me. You know, oh, that's cool. Just forget about it for now. It was a faith that resulted in life changes. Hebrews 11 is the record that describes Abraham. It says, by faith, Abraham believed, uh, obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise. 
as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. This is the record of Abraham's faith. And he is called the father of faith for a good reason. Not only for those who believe in God and still follow the Mosaic law, those who are Jews, those who are biological descendants of Abraham, but also for us who are spiritual descendants of Abraham. Abraham followed, obeyed, and trusted God because of who God is. He had a clearer view of who God is. And it was based on this clear view and understanding of who God is that Abraham could act, could trust and obey. We are Abraham's children if we have faith like him. Before, I think last week or maybe it was two weeks ago, I quoted from a often sung children's song that Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. It goes, I am one of them and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. There is an issue with that song. Because the song should more properly say, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. What about you? Just because we swim in the water doesn't make us a fish. And just because you sit in the pews at church doesn't make you a Christian. The question is, do you have faith in God? Do you believe him? Do you believe what he says and what he promises and that everything that he says he will do, he will do? That when he says that I have punished Christ so that you might be saved, to believe in the message of salvation means to believe that God said that and that it's true. When God says, come and follow, to believe God means to listen, understand, and to obey. Kind of this heard, understood, and acknowledged, but responded to appropriately. And that is the faith of Abraham. And that is the faith of all who believe in Christ. So let me remind us that though we may sit here gathered in this room, the question remains that Father Abraham had many sons and that many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. What about you? Let me pray for us. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the testimony of Scripture that is not just written as a piece of history to preserve for the Israelites today, but it is written as a testimony of your work in and through people's lives. Help us, Lord, to learn from Abraham that though the obstacles were many, he believed in your promise and that you would be able to overcome them all. 
Thank you for the reminder this morning. And we pray, Lord, that if anyone is here who does not trust in you, who has not placed his or her faith in you, that today would be the day. In your son's name we pray. Amen.